Okay, we are live. Here we are, folks, for another Love Your Liver live stream. My name is Dr. Garrett Smith. I am also known around his YouTube parts as the Nutrition Detective. And we are doing um, all subscriber Q&A. You know, if you, you want to do questions in the live chat, I'm going to get to as many as I can. And uh, you got to subscribe to the channel to be in the live chat. For those of you who are watching this later, go to the live chat. What, make sure you enable the live chat replay when you're watching it. And that is where all of the, uh, all of the links that I put will be someday. I'll manage to get one of those live stream softwares <laughs> and learn how to use it. Um, but I haven't done it yet because I have what I consider more pressing things to do. Like today, the reason I'm late, those of you who are here live know I'm I may be five minutes late starting. I do that to let people filter in, but today I'm, it's like 15 minutes late because I got very involved in writing the vitamin A and diabetes thread for Twitter. I think it's about 50 tweets. And those of you who know how much research I do, it's, it's a lot and it's eye opening and I cover every angle of vitamin A. Do you know there's a couple of studies on mice where when they reduced the vitamin A in their diet, they had less diabetes or they prevented diabetes from happening in, they called them Zucker diabetic fatty mice. So they were mice that are genetically bred to tend to get diabetes and be fat. And they prevented diabetes in them when they didn't give them as much vitamin A. What? <laughs> and people are like, carbs cause diabetes. And no, no. I mean, you don't want to eat crap food. It's a given. But when they reduce the amount of vitamin A and in, in mice and rats diets and they have less diabetes and they have some, they prevent diabetes, like seriously, come on. And then they show that vitamin A reduces your insulin resistance. I'm sorry, increases your insulin resistance, decreases your insulin sensitivity. So it's the vitamin A that's making the carbs the problem. It's not that the carbs are the problem. The carbs feed into the vitamin A that's already the problem. Anyway, I'm going to go over all this in my thread. Hopefully I'll remember to uh, post it here later. Um, but that should go live at about sometime after noon, after my inner circle. So for those of you who are new here, it really helps us to get out there. If you if you do comment in the chat, that's great. That also means you're a subscriber. So, But those of you who are not subscribers, if you want to comment in the chat, make sure to subscribe. If you're in the chat, click out of it, X out of it for a second, go like this um, broadcast. And if you're here later, um, if you leave, if you like it and leave a comment, that also helps the computers to know that people enjoy this. So, oh, we also have super chats enabled. I saw one already. Um, super chats will bring your question to the top of the queue and I will answer it first. So now that that's all done, let's get into it. Where was it? Okay. M&M Professional Window Cleaners uh, sent a super chat. Uh, I appreciate that greatly. Thank you. Let's get into it. I've been reading about heavy metal toxicity, mercury, and aluminum. How does one detox from this without ruining health with charlatan methods? Charlatan methods. Yes. Let me adjust my camera just a little bit. Okay. So many of you out there, including myself, um, have gotten sucked into the heavy metals are the cause of all toxicity out there completely, right? Heavy metals are everything. And are they good for you? No, they're not good for you. But your body has been getting rid of toxic metals. Humans have been getting rid of toxic metals ever since they've been around. We have methods to get rid of them. And if, if, if it can get in, here's the thing to remember. Toxic metals are bigger than good minerals. That's the If you look at the periodic table, right? The toxic metals are further down it, which means basically they're bigger in size and the good minerals that we tend to use, you know, the potassium, magnesium, zinc, selenium, molybdenum are higher on the chart, which means they're smaller in size, if you will. 
I saw some people saying that there's no way that the good minerals can get to the places that the bad minerals are stuck. And I'm like, that makes absolutely no sense because the good minerals are smaller. Why, why could big toxic metals get into places that the smaller good ones couldn't? So that, that whole idea of people saying that you can't, you can't displace them. What we, what we do, let me give you the general idea of what we do. First, if you remove, if you are constantly being exposed to toxic metals, your first and only priority at that point is to reduce your exposure, eliminate the exposure. This is the thing that people don't think about. They've got mercury fillings in their mouth, or they're still eating fish three or four times a week, or shellfish, even worse. And they're like, I'm going to do a mercury detox. You've already got mercury coming in on an almost daily basis with those scenarios. It's coming in. How's it coming into you? Well, it's going in and it's getting into your blood. Okay, so you've got mercury coming in, floating through your blood. And then you or your practitioner decide to do a detox without eliminating the source that's constantly coming in. So you take some chelators or some, you know, chlorella or whatever to pull it out of your system. Now, the thing you need to know about these things that pull it out of your system is their grip is not always very strong and they, it can grab onto something and pull it out of the tissues, but then it loses it. It like loses its grip. So now you just have free toxic metal floating around your system. Some of you have felt this before. And then you can retoxify. You can, your body will put that free toxic metal right back into places. It'll just put it right back because it doesn't want it in the blood. But also you've got the, so you've got the, the chelator pulling stuff out of your tissues and, and some of it's losing its grip. And then you've already got the toxic metals that you're putting in. Whether it's your fillings off gassing, they off gas forever. I've shown, I've shown a link to the videos before. If you go to IAOMT, if you go to their YouTube page, you can find video of a 30 or 40 year old amalgam filling in the black light and they rub an eraser on it, a pencil eraser. That's like, that's similar to food in terms of like the, the chewing on something's this, the texture and stuff like that, the, the hardness. So anyway, they're rubbing it on the mercury filling and you see the off gassing happen in a 40 year old filling or something like that. Do not believe basically here's a good rule of thumb. Do not believe anything about toxicity or lack of toxicity from dentists. My dad was a dentist. He was a great dentist. I don't trust dentists these days as far as I could throw them. No way. They, they don't know anything about toxicity in the first place. Why would they? They look at your mouth. You can't even get dentists to say that sugar causes cavities these days anymore. <laughs> they have mostly sold out so badly. They have sold out everybody. Dentists used to be the greatest nutritionists on earth, like in the early 1900s. And now they're pharmaceutical shills and medical equipment shills. They just want to put implants in your mouth and do all that stuff. So back to the idea. So I'm not a fan on chelators. Chelators are, it's in the research. They suck out good minerals. They absolutely do. So you've got something that's like the, the DMSA, the EDTA and that stuff. <clears throat> you put them in and it, yes, it's going to grab onto some of the toxic metals and yes, it's absolutely going to suck out some of the good minerals. And then people go, well, I'll just put the good minerals back in. And I go, how much do you need? Were you already deficient? So now you're making an already present deficiency worse. Is the amount you're going to re-add enough to cover what you're losing from the chelator and to fix your deficiency? And people are like, I, I, I don't know. And then I've seen some of these mineral repletion supplements. One that's commonly given by by alternative practitioners has manganese and copper in it. I'm like, oh, you don't need any more of those. 
So they're going to give you like a, a combo mineral supplement that's not designed specifically for you in the amounts you need because you don't know and your practitioner doesn't know because they never tested. And then they're giving you toxic metals at the same time as they're trying to give you good ones. And it's just, it's a shite show. So then we get into the natural chelators. We get into chlorella and uh, uh, what's the other one? Blue green algae and spirulina. And everybody's like, these grab on to talk. Oh, cilantro. All of them are hugely full of vitamin A. Huge, huge. Algae in general in the ocean makes tons of vitamin A. Tons. Carotenoids. Blue-green algae has, so they were trying to relate blue-green algae, a compound in blue-green algae to Alzheimer's. I did a, let me find my huge article on Alzheimer's. On my old forum. They were trying to relate this compound in blue-green algae to Alzheimer's. And I'm sitting here going... Well, here's, a, here's all my research connecting vitamin A toxicity to Alzheimer's. And what is blue-green algae super high in? Vitamin A. Weird that it would be connected. So, let's get into, let's get into mercury and aluminum. And other ones specifically. Let's let me run through in my head the uh, the toxic metals that I that I see and how we deal with them in general. These are general things. I'm not recommending that any of you out there do any of these specific things because if you're not working with me directly, I am not your doctor. So you uh, you undergo life at your own risk. Okay. So let's think. Let me think here. Uranium on a hair test, it's usually, it's, it's the naturally occurring form of uranium. It's typically from groundwater, your tap water. If it's in your tap water, it's going to show up in your hair from your shower. I don't, I don't worry about that too much unless somebody has like a really high level that's not coming down. There's going to be a background amount of it in the water. So uranium, arsenic, arsenic is rice <laughs> guaranteed. Arsenic is in white rice. Arsenic is in brown rice. Arsenic is in rice. I've talked about this before. One of the key minerals. Oh, so let me, let me back up one second about how we deal with toxic metals. We first know the major sources of how they're coming in. So arsenic, rice. Let me think. Mercury and cadmium, fish or shellfish. Cadmium can also be from old cigarette smoking. And yes, you can store that stuff in your body for a long time. I'm not going to go over all the sources. So please don't, oh, you missed this source and all this stuff. I'm going to go over the common things that I fix in people that brings their stuff down. So mercury and cadmium, most people don't know about cadmium and fish and shellfish, but cadmium absolutely comes with mercury in fish and shellfish. And I can watch the levels go down as I have people reduce their fish. Well, as people choose to reduce their fish and shellfish intake. Lead, um, usually with lead, we, we talk specifically about lead and where the sources are, if it shows up high in people, because it usually doesn't show up high in very many people. Can it be from clay? Oh, there might be a lot of people out there taking bentonite clay or montmorillonite clay or all this stuff. Clay is hugely high in lead, commonly. And... If you swallow it, if you swallow clay with lead, the, your stomach acid frees up the lead from the clay. Gosh, does this sound familiar to chelators? And so you free up and now the lead's free to be absorbed. So I'm less concerned if you're using clay in your mouth and you're not swallowing it, I'm less concerned with that because I haven't seen that show up on hair tests. Um, what else do we have? Aluminum. I go over in the Love Your Liver program, I think there's about eight major sources of aluminum in foods. And food, you know, cooking, cook with like aluminum cookware, aluminum foil, um, Tetra Packs, 
the the kind of packs that hold soy milk and rice milk and chicken broth and all that stuff, coconut water lined with aluminum. People say, oh, but there's a clear coating over it. I'm like, I can tell on a hair test that the aluminum goes up and down with as many Tetra packs as people eat. So obviously it's not working well. Aluminum cans, like soda cans, sparkling water cans. The more acidic the liquid is that's in an aluminum can, the more aluminum it leaches. Well, carbon dioxide is acidic. So, but there's, there's more sources. I go over those in the love your liver network. So aluminum is more aluminum. We, we look long-term, we look at reducing your, your sources. Magnesium has been shown to detox aluminum. Now people will talk about silica water, like Fiji and Volvic. Has that been shown to reduce aluminum deposits in research? Yes. Have I, I've used Fiji water with my mother. I'm not getting into the politics of Fiji right now and the Fiji water thing and all that stuff. I'm not getting into that. My, we used Fiji. My mom had really high aluminum on her hair test and it wasn't from, <laughs> you can imagine my mom's house has been cleared of aluminum sources. I, you know, I take care of my mom. And I was going, why I can't get this aluminum down? And it took a while, but we did the Fiji water and it did come down. It d absolutely did come down. So does it work? Yes. But then, then people say, put plastic bottles. And I'm like, yep, yep, yep. What are you going to do? You pick your poison sometimes. The world is not perfect. If you are out there and you obsess over every little minutia thing, you're going to get analysis, paralysis by analysis and you will never get anywhere. I've had people call me from the store because they believe every idiot on the internet about what you shouldn't eat. And they said they were in the store and they said, I can't eat anything in the store. I'm, I can't buy anything. And I was like, I didn't tell you to do all that. You're believing every joker on the internet. If you believe every joker on the internet about all the things you have to avoid, you paint yourself in a corner and there is no escape and you can't eat anything and you're going to die of starvation. Man, I got to fix that water bottle. The little rubber seal came out of it, so it leaks all the time. So that's aluminum. Mercury, cadmium, and lead. The most important minerals to help. So what, what do we do? What do we do to get the minerals out? So here's the thing your body does. Your body will is going to put either a good mineral or a toxic mineral in certain spots. Think of it as in your body, there's like apartments, like holding spaces for minerals. And certain size spaces can fit certain minerals. You're going to like, so in a, like an apartment building, right? So if mercury and cadmium and lead can live in the same size apartment as zinc and selenium, one of those things is going to be occupying those spots. If you are exposing, if you are not, if you have a zinc and selenium deficiency, you're not going to be having zinc and selenium in as many of those apartments. And so then when you go out in your world and you're exposed to lead and cadmium and mercury, you go outside, you, there's, there's car exhaust. You know, you walk through somebody smoking cigarettes, you eat some fish, you do whatever. Those toxic metals come and they move in and they take the apartments because the apartments are open because you don't have zinc and selenium living there because you have a chronic zinc or selenium deficiency. So what do we do? So imagine your body naturally has cell turnover. So think of it as the apartments are going to, at some point, kick out the tenant. That could be a toxic metal. That could be a good metal. What do you want to have waiting to move in? when the toxic metal moves out? Or is it possible that the good minerals can kick out the bad ones? So what we do is you have, we, when we are restoring zinc and selenium as an example, as your body naturally, and, and we reduce, think about it this way, we reduce the mercury, cadmium, and lead coming in through dietary approaches 
avoiding it, getting rid of mercury fillings, stuff like that. We avoid those sources. So all of a sudden, naturally, the turnover of the apartments, those cars start moving out. The natural detox process moves some of those toxic metals out. And then we put in the good minerals so that they can move into the apartments and stay there. So then if you are exposed to toxic metals in the future, they try to come in and take an apartment, but the zinc and selenium are like, nope, we're here. Can't move in. And they just keep moving along. This is, this is really how people think toxic heavy metal detox is like super complicated. It's not, it's not, I had a phase of my practice where I did the, the urine tests with the DMSA chelator, the captamer and all that stuff. And I'd have people, I, I gave it up because I had people where their, their urine test would improve immensely. And they were like, I don't feel any different. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Is toxic metal the problem that I thought it was? And I started going, I don't think, basically my impression, I move on from things once I see that it's not helping enough. I was always looking for the root cause. That's always what I've been doing. Not, not a protocol by that name, but I have always been looking for the treat the root cause. That is naturopathic philosophy at its finest. And if you're not dealing with toxicities and deficiencies, you're probably not dealing with the root cause of anything. So we just talked about, so, so mercury, cadmium, and lead, remove the sources, put back in the minerals that kick that stuff out and then help protect your body against it. Uh, what else was there? Arsenic, zinc actually helps kick out arsenic. But don't go thinking that, so here's, here's the problem. People think that if they just take the good mineral, they can just keep eating like tons of fish or do whatever, like eat tons of rice, eat tons of fish because they have the zinc to protect them. That's not how it works. There's a, there's a saying I go by here, the poison always wins. You, the key thing, the, the, it has always been and will always be more important that you avoid the toxins more so than worrying about the superfoods and taking a bunch of supplements, which is probably what a lot of you either used to do or you may be doing while you're listening to this. You're going, but I'm taking all these super, I love these, these words, nutrient-dense foods. I'm eating all these super nutrient-dense foods and I'm taking all these supplements, bottles and bottles and bottles and bottles. And I don't feel better or I feel better for a little while and then I feel worse and I, or I'm just steadily getting worse over time. And every practitioner I see, maybe I feel a little better for a while and then I feel worse. And my supplement graveyard continues to grow. And I don't know even what to take anymore. So I just take it. Adding more and more things to your health, like supplement wise, is not going to make you healthier. Your health is more of... We trim away things that you don't need because your liver has to process everything in you that comes in. Everything. It's still work. Like if there's things in your day that you like doing, it still takes time from your day. You still have to take time to deal with it. So every supplement that you take that isn't helping you or even worse is making you worse, it's adding up. Your liver's dealing with it. Hormones are like some of the biggest, most complex things your liver deals with. So if you're out there taking hormone therapy, I'm going to tell you, your liver was already bad when you started on hormones. And now you adding more hormones for your liver to deal with when it couldn't deal with stuff before is just going to make things crash and burn faster. This is why steroids are associated with liver problems. It's not just that they're steroids, that's, that's hormone therapy. Don't ever confuse the two. Testosterone replacement therapy and estrogen replacement therapy are basically steroid therapy. It's just the doses are different. Okay. So th those are like some, uh, those are like some of the ideas that we do. It's, it's very simple. We do, we do three things in this world, in this program. We reduce or minimize the toxins coming in which is exactly what we're talking about here. We help the body to remove stored toxins, which is what like the minerals would do. And then 
we give the body the mineral it ne- minerals it needs, especially the minerals it needs to both it helps kick out the bad minerals and it helps protect the body against the toxic metals. The, the philosophy runs the same. This is one thing I love about how, how my journey getting here is now everything fits into the philosophy. It all makes sense. Believe me, people come here and you guys tell me you appreciate that things finally make sense. And I can't tell you, I, I couldn't do this if it didn't make sense to me first. So hopefully uh, we got that question well. I would like to think we did. So remember that, that was, uh, so thank you again for that super chat. If anybody has a super chat, you want it to come to the top, um, go ahead and do that. But otherwise I'm going to start from the top of the questions and go down. So first question now at the top of the chat list, David Hagerston, good, good guy in the, in the network. He asked, how long did you avoid nightshades before discovering Grant Genereau? The Grant Genereau is the guy who, who introduced me to vitamin A toxicity. And he's a good, good buddy. Um, having, he's having a rough time in Canada right now. Canada is just, <laughs> Canada is just awful in terms of like just falling into, uh, the ism of the commune, you know, anyway, nice. He asks, how much do you think that avoidance has helped your present journey? Well, when did I start really avoiding nightshades? It was probably a couple years after I got out of naturopathic school. Um, so maybe like 2006, 2007, I was definitely down in Tucson. And funny story, I had gone up to Phoenix to see a, a chiropractor, an ND chiropractor who did lots of muscle testing. And he was, uh, AK, he did applied kinesiology, which most people know simply as muscle testing. And I went up to him and he starts doing the testing and he tests me for, it's like late November, like, or it's early December. And he, he tests me and he tests, I think, uh, tomatoes first. And it, it was a, it was something that was not good for me. And I went, okay, why don't you just test the other ingredients of pizza while you're at it? So he tests, I said, test dairy and test gluten. So he tests dairy and he tests gluten. And he's like, those are not good for you. And those were the main things in that, in that session. I, he said, okay, so I want you to avoid those for a month and come back to me. So we're getting into the holiday season, right? Not a, not an easy time to eat well. And I said, okay. 30 days, holiday season, no gluten, no dairy, no nightshades. And I did it. And I actually came out into the new year. I had lost, I had lost weight instead of gaining weight like everybody does around the holidays. And in that month, I had gone in because I used to have chronically painful. I used to have a middle back pain, mid back pain, which is no one knew how to fix it. I, if, when people tell me I've tried everything, I'm like, oh, you don't even know what I tried. I had a little French lady with a crystal inside of a chalk holder who would dig into me and she'd put, when you were done, she'd put aspirin patches on it. Like you'd leave her, her office, her house with aspirin patches all over you. She told me I was one of the few men who didn't make a bunch of noise during the treatment. I mean, she was digging in. Like when you think of pressure point stuff, I mean, she's got a pointed crystal. Like I did, people are like, I've done it all. I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. Let me tell you, let me tell you. I've probably got you there. So nothing helped, nothing physical helped, nothing dietary that I did helped until I avoided nightshades, gluten, and dairy for a month. And by the end of that month, my middle back pain was gone. So that was an early connection of, oh, my pain is dietary related, chemical related. Later, I figured out that that pain was probably referred pain from my adrenal gland or kidneys, either one, but it was basically at the top of the kidney area, which is where the adrenals sit. So did that. Then I started getting really into nightshades. Let me find my nightshades article on the Weston Price. Oh yeah. So 2010. So this article that I'm linking here, this is my article 
on the, of all places, the Weston A. Price Foundation website. And I actually spoke at the same, I spoke on a convention on this. So I had done the convention before this. Chris Master John was there, which is just hilarious now. He was talking about uh, cruciferous vegetables and being bad for the thyroid, which I don't have people eat those generally either now, or at least minimize them. They can do, you can do some of them, but generally the high sulfur content, high sulfur slows your detox. Just remember if everybody out there is saying you need sulfur to run your detox, no, it's the opposite. Sulfur slows your detox. In the research, they, they give disulfiram, disulfiram, two sulfurs to slow down your ALDH. They give it to alcoholics so that alcoholics, if they drink, they can't process the acetaldehyde. So they build up acetaldehyde and they feel like absolute dog crap. Disulfiram. And then there's all sorts of other medications that cause, they call it disulfiram-like reactions. Probably because they inhibit ALDH. Sulfur inhibits ALDH. It's not a good combo. Don't think that so. And so onions, garlic, cruciferous vegetables. Now, sulfur's in all foods. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's everywhere. You cannot avoid it completely. But if you just minimize the major, major, major sources of it, which would be supplements and cruciferous vegetables and um, alliums, garlic and onions and that family. And then uh, another big source is egg whites. That's why people get such stinky egg farts. It's the sulfur in the egg whites. Okay. Egg yolks full of vitamin A and lecithin, which you need to store vitamin A in your liver, and egg whites full of sulfur. And if you haven't seen my eggs and choline thread on Twitter, you can go and see that, and you can see what the combination of those things do in terms of disease, proven disease later in life. Connected fatty liver, connected early death, connected cancer, connected heart disease. Anyway, so nightshades. <clears throat> I am a huge advocate of minimizing nightshades people who are really sensitive really have to avoid them completely people who are so nightshades cause a calcium problem they cause a calcium excess problem that's why people often feel more painful or more stiff when they eat a lot of them what do nightshades contain the especially red peppers and tomatoes contain tons of vitamin a Tons. The nightshades also contain calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. Vitamin A plus vitamin D will calcify you where you stand. Then they contain other toxic, what are called glycoalkaloids, alpha solanine or solanine and chaconine and other stuff like that. That's just toxic to begin with. So the only nightshade that we really kind of would allow, I don't, I don't want to use the word allow, but that's, that's like, okay for people to, you know, have as they see fit is white potatoes that are very well peeled. And I will tell you that the more you boil the hell out of the potatoes, the less reaction you'll have to them. Now you want to do steam cooking to them, like Insta, instant pot, stuff like that. That's fine. I'm just going to tell you that I've heard better things from people who boil the heck out of them. Boil them to death. So eggplants, there was a, there was a uh, story in, uh, oh, I see the super chat. There was a story, there was a, a myth in uh, like an urban legend in, I think it was Italy back in like late 1800s, early 1900s, where if you ate eggplant every day for a month, you would go insane. And it's not just from getting sick of eggplant. It's probably because of the toxins in it. Eggplant's the most toxic of the common nightshades. Tomatoes, uh, if you wanted to see, let me find this. I'll find my thread on prostate cancer. Everybody's like, lycopene's good for prostates. No. I'd be amazed at some of the research that shows that it's bad for it. I remember back in the day, uh, Lauren, I don't think you can get this article on the internet anymore, but Lauren Cordain, the paleo diet guy, said that he thought that the supposed benefits of lycopene 
in the prostate was like friendly fire damage. So it was like the lycopene was causing damage to the prostate. But in so doing, it was actually destroying like prostate cancer cells and prostate cells. So it would, it would BPH might be a little less and you might see a little less prostate cancer because it's just damaging everything. That was his statement. Um, if I had to rank them, like the eggplant's probably the most toxic. When I was in naturopathic medical school, one of the things I did, my buddy told me, he's like, my mom's knees are so bad, man. What can I do to help her? And I said, does she eat a lot of nightshades? And he's like, you know, in naturopathic school, what are those? And I was like, eggplant, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, that kind of stuff. And he goes, my mom eats eggplant all the time. I said, S -s tell her to stop doing that. At the end of a month, he said, my mom is kneeling at church again. She couldn't kneel at church because her knees hurt so bad. And, and in a month, she's kneeling at, ch at church again. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, I can deal with potatoes on occasion. The, the sicker you are, let me just put it this way. The sicker you are, the less you should eat nightshades. Potatoes are the ones that people will, the potatoes seem to be the least toxic. Well-peeled, well-cooked potatoes seem to be the least toxic. Did I just say they're not toxic? No, I said they're the least toxic. The mistake that people make here is people will start eating white potatoes daily because they go, oh, they're full of potassium and they're low in vitamin A and I love them. And then what happens is slowly, people, if you if you've had this happen before, feel free to comment in the chat or in the comments later. People eat them daily or every other day or whatever. And then all of a sudden they, they come back to me and they go, Dr. Smith, this old problem I had is getting worse. Or now I'm getting this new problem and what's going on? And I ask them for their diet and they're like, yeah, I've been eating potatoes a lot. And I'm like, it's, that's it. Potatoes are sneaky. Potatoes are insidious. So it doesn't mean you can't eat them, but if you're eating them on a daily basis or an every other day basis, the, the toxicity of them is going to creep up on you. It's just, I've seen it too many times. So it doesn't mean people can't eat them. Some people eat potatoes and they're wrecked. They're absolutely wrecked. But some people get away with it because they are sneaky. And then they wonder why a month or two or three later, they're like, why is my asthma acting up again? I don't get it. And I'm like, potatoes. And they're like, but I felt fine when I started eating them. And I'm like, yep. No, I, I don't know why, but no one gets the chronic toxicity like I do. Maybe it's just my pattern recognition over time. I just, I see this and I've had, I had to fix myself. But uh, the, the red nightshades, especially the, pep the peppers and the tomatoes, super high in vitamin A. Uh, capsaicin, one, one, I'm sorry, not capsaicin, but one of the, one of the capsaicinoid or the capsinoid compounds related to capsaicin, the spicy stuff. Uh, David Hagerson himself showed that it breaks into two retinoic acids. So when you eat spicy peppers, some of the compounds in that are likely it's, it was two, he showed this, the chemistry, it was two retinoic acids stuck together. Your body probably breaks those apart because it can metabolize vitamin A, right? So it probably breaks those apart. Now you've got two retinase floating around in your system. Wonder why they're inflammatory? So the nightshade thing was a big part of the development. And it was kind of one of the early things where I went, oh my gosh. You know, I mean, my, one of my earliest things was when I was like 15, I realized that even like halfway through a glass of milk, I started getting all phlegmy and mucusy. That was one of the first times I went, okay, what I eat affects how I feel. That's okay, cool. Um, and then later it was the gluten, the dairy, and the nightshades. And now I, I don't, if you're getting started in this and you do what I'm doing now, you're probably not going to get better because I'm at the point where I've, as you get rid of these things and you get more resilient and your bile becomes less toxic and you're leaking less bile. And if you're not sure about all this leaking bile and toxic bile stuff, go back to live stream 71 which is the one where people tell me you could go back to the very first live stream or you could go back to live stream 71 and watch that. And that's where I really get into toxic bile theory and all the stuff it does. Okay. I'm not going to go over that today. I'm already 
I'm already an hour, you know, 45 minutes in and I've only gotten two questions. So, but the, the nightshade thing really helped me to realize that. And then, then when I got into the vitamin A thing and I went and I looked at the content of vitamin A of most of the nightshades, that blew my mind. Cause I was like, wow, no wonder they're so inflammatory. Nightshades are generally good to avoid. I mean, remember plants, plants can't move. Now I'm not getting all total carnivore on you, but plants can't move. So plants are good at making chemical warfare defense, chemical warfare defense. I was talking to somebody on Twitter this morning. Who's like, they're trying to talk about spicy food. Somebody, somebody said they made a ghost pepper smoothie. And I was like, oh man, why do you think cops use pepper spray? Is it because it's anti-inflammatory and all the people they spray with it feel like their joint pains and all their problems go away after they get sprayed with it? Or is it chemical warfare? It's chemical warfare. Do you think that eating chemical warfare is going to make you healthier? Let me show, oh wait, let me find the Mexico City study. Chili pepper consumption and gastric stomach cancer in Mexico City, a case control study. What the guy tried to say, oh, when the, when the capsaicinoids or the capsaicin goes through your saliva, it breaks it down and then it's good for you. And I was like, mm, okay, okay, here's, here's this paper. Uh, let me read the quote. Where was it? Chili pepper consumers were at high risk for gastric stomach cancer compared with non-consumers. I'm skipping ahead. The odds ratio for high level consumers of spicy food compared with non-consumers was 17.11. 17 times higher rate of stomach cancer. Hmm. Hmm. I guess that saliva doesn't break it down. And that's just another urban legend people are telling themselves so they feel better about eating chemical warfare. There's another thing that happens in your guts, which is, well, so I, I have research on spicy foods. Capsaicin stimulates cortisol and adrenaline. Those are fight or flight things, right? Why is your body going into fight or flight when you eat something unless it's a poison? Why do people get addicted to spicy foods? Because it stimulates adrenaline and cortisol and they like the high they get like adrenaline junkies and they may feel better for a little while because they just stimulated cortisol and they might feel like their pain gets a little better for a while because they just anti-inflame themselves with their body's own cortisol, right? Now, the other thing, the other sign that you know that your body doesn't like capsaicin or capsaicinoids is that it actually, it reduces the time that food, the food that you ate with that in it goes, it takes to go through your intestinal tract. Your transit time, as they call it, decreases. Your body desperately wants to crap it out. So it speeds up how fast you poop. Am I, am I advocating you use this if you're constipated? Absolutely not. That would be asinine. No, we don't use poisons. We don't use herbal laxatives or chemical warfare agents to speed your pooping. That's dumb. Robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of thing. Okay. But I think I've done enough on this topic for today. Basically the less nightshades you eat, the better off you'll be. What is mainstream trying to do? They're trying to tell you that spicy food is healthy. They're trying to tell you that tomatoes are great for cancer. They're trying to tell you that I don't even know what they tell you about eggplant because that is just the worst food ever. It's just mush. It's just garbage. Just throw it away. Potatoes. They've, they've got people eating potatoes every way. And how do they try to get you to eat potatoes out of all the restaurants, right? What do they do with them? They deep fry them in genetically modified soy and canola oil. It's almost like they're trying to reduce us by specifically getting us to love foods that are absolutely terrible for us. Tomatoes are in everything, right? They love to combine. Think about this. Think of American cuisine, Western cuisine. 
they take some common, most foods, many, many foods, many, many foods are a combination of these things, gluten, beef, which I'm not against, cheese, and tomatoes. You can think of, there's Mexican food, there's Italian food, there's hamburgers, there, you can just go pizza, you can go through all the Western food and it's, a com it's often a combination of those three things. And then if you put pork in there, it's even worse. Bacon, remember the bacon fad that's still going on? Ooh, bacon's full of vitamin A. It doesn't show up on testing because it's in the retinoic acid form and they don't test for that. But lard contains what's called uh, lard factor which I've shown other places is vitamin A. Go type into PubMed, go type, let's do, let's just do it right now. Let's do lard factor vitamin A PubMed. There's people out there in the vitamin A detox world suggesting that people, uh, people eat pork and egg yolks, eggs. And it's just going to end badly. Lard factor vitamin. I'm going to put the search here. Oh, that didn't work as well. So I'm going back to the, the duck, duck, go search. Here we go. Identification of the so-called lard factor as vitamin A. Nature of the vitamin A like factor in lard. An unknown factor with vitamin A activity distilled from lard. Okay. People are like, but the internet said there's no vitamin A in pork. Well, the internet is wrong. You go, there's that search. So you can see there's more. So I'm moving on, but thank you, David. That's a good question. But yeah, nightshades were a huge part of my development to this point. And nightshades are generally the less nightshades you eat in general, the better you will feel. Just think of them as basically you're eating inflammation. Maybe you can handle it. Probably you, you feel, you'll feel a lot better without it. Okay. Uh, let me find that, uh, super chat from Will. Um, Will asks, can fructose make you constipated? I'm guessing it occupies some hepatic throughput reducing bile output, been eating bananas and apples. Okay. So I want to be clear here. I'm not anti fruit. I want to be clear on this point. One of the ways in the research that researchers cause cholestasis or toxic leaky bile in animals is they give them a high fructose diet. Other variations that they can use to give them toxic leaky bile or cholestasis is they either do, they might do a low protein diet or they do a high fructose diet or they do a high fat diet. Can you link all the fad diets of today to any one of those? And then you wonder why people do them and maybe they feel better at the start and then long-term they feel like they got their butt kicked and their health is going downhill. You've already shown it in the research. That's how you do these things. I call it the duration paradox where people do things short term and they feel better and long term it's going to destroy them. Isn't that the whole basis of like pharmaceutical medicine? Short term you feel a little better. Maybe your labs look better and long term it destroys you with poison. It's not just pharmaceuticals that do that. Okay. So anyway, can fructose make you constipated? It's possible. I, I, here I'll, let me see. Let me see if there's anything easy in the research. Ooh, fructose. Here's the first paper that comes up. Fructose intolerance, cause or cure of chronic functional constipation. Let's see. Wait, what? Let me see. Okay. There were 367 patients who underwent the fructose breath hydrogen test, out of which 208 patients had fructose intolerance. 
Clinical presentations included chronic abdominal pain, chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, emesis, vomiting, and nausea. So do you see how this is why I tell pe people, people want, what does vitamin A toxicity look like? Well, some things that are affecting your liver, depending upon you, can look one way or they can look completely the opposite. I just went and said symptoms, clinical presentations of fructose intolerance, chronic diarrhea, or chronic constipation could be one or the other or both. And then people go, well, how does that work? And I go, it's all just rooted in chronic diarrhea. You got way too much toxic bile dumping into your intestines and your body says, get rid of this. Chronic constipation is the bile is not going into your intestines. It's going back into your blood. So you're not pooping well. Emesis, vomiting, and nausea, that's bile going back up into their stomach. So do you see with fructose intolerance, again, it's bile patterns. The bile is going the wrong places. Chronic abdominal pain. Gosh, do you think talk too much toxic bile in your guts could cause your guts to hurt? Anyway, so they're saying statistical significance was reached for chronic constipation, emesis, vomiting, and nausea being less likely to be found in fructose breath hydrogen test positive patients. So they're saying thus fructose intolerance may help resolve symptoms in patients with chronic functional constipation. I don't understand how having one problem would resolve symptoms. <laughs> this, is the, this is the most messed up thing in medicine. They're like, if you have this problem, then it solves your chronic functional constipation. This, I, uh, this is how... Um, dumb modern medicine is. But fructose, could it affect bile flow? Well, obviously, if, if they feed mice and rats high fructose diets in studies, and it tends to lead to cholestasis or toxic bile going back into the blood, it definitely means it affects the liver's ability to produce and excrete bile. Let me well, let me go look up. Let me go look that up. Fruc I'm looking up fructose bile excretion. PubMed. Easier to search PubMed using other websites than it is to to do um, often to do it on PubMed itself. God. <sighs> we tested the effect. So here's the study. The study is protective effect of bile acids on the onset of fructose induced hepatic steatosis in mice. So they gave these mice fructose induced fatty liver which means that the liver is storing tox more toxicity, more fat-soluble toxicity, which includes bile acids in it. Remember, fatty acid is yellow. Bile is all, can, one of the major colors of bile is yellow. One of the major colors of vitamin A is yellow. Never forget, one of the major colors of egg yolks is yellow. Egg yolks have been connected with fatty liver. It only took like two or three a week to increase the fatty liver risk by 3.71 times. So anyway, they gave these they gave these mice bile in their water. Oh. In mice concomitantly treated with bile acids, the onset of fructose-induced hepatic steatosis was markedly attenuated. It was slowed down compared to mice fed only fructose. Great. So they gave them bile by mouth, and they saw that there was that it took them longer to get to fatty uh, fatty liver. Great. Don't take bile if you don't. It, there's only one or two situations where I think taking bile like ox. If you're missing a gallbladder, you may need some ox bile. 
But if you're missing a gallbladder, the thing you have to understand is your liver and your bile are so toxic that the very container that's made to hold your bile, your gallbladder, broke down. That's how toxic your bile was. Okay. This would be like saying, I have this bottle. It's made to hold water. But for some reason, the toxic water I put in it was so toxic, it dissolved the glass. Okay. If you have gallbladder problems, it means that your bile is extremely, extremely toxic. And there's, there's the mistaken notion that people out there have thinking that increasing your diet, dietary fat is going to help you get rid of bile. Well, it wouldn't make sense in the gallbladder problems if those women were really good at getting it. To, they connect gallbladder problems with high fat diets. Well, the high fat diet that gave this woman gallstones and gallbladder problems obviously didn't get rid of bile fast enough. Don't get humans are not designed for high fat diets. We're not. I will die on that hill. We are not designed for mega high fat diets. That's why gallbladders fail. That's why livers get fatty when people eat high fat diets over time. It takes time. But anyway, so, so if somebody was, well, so Will, here we go with the answer to the question. There's not that much fructose in, let's say, bananas and apples. There's not that much sugar in them. You know what I mean? But if you, I mean, okay, so let's, let's back that up too, though. What do they tell people who have diarrhea? What's the diet that they tell people with diarrhea to eat? If you're having chronic diarrhea, there's the BRAT diet. What does BRAT stand for? Bananas, rice, applesauce, uh, toast. Specifically, I believe it's white toast. One of the things that those, well, so we could go through each one of those things, but bananas, they're, if, if something is to help with chronic constipation, I'm sorry, chronic diet, if something's to help with diarrhea, sorry, diarrhea, if something's meant to help with diarrhea and they're giving bananas, that may mean that bananas are a little constipating. A lot of people know that rice by itself is very constipating because there's, there's no soluble fiber in it. And then applesauce, why would applesauce, people go, but applesauce has pectin. Uh, actually, applesauce has less pectin because we're talking about, we're not talking about homemade applesauce. They're not feeding people in the hospitals homemade applesauce, freshly made applesauce. They're feeding them garbage in plastic or glass containers that has been heated. Listen to me very carefully, folks. If you are willing to make fresh homemade applesauce and you cook it and you don't put it into a sealed glass container and then heat, pasteurize it. So if you can applesauce, I am talking about that. I'm not talking about like if you made fresh applesauce and you just put it in your fridge and you eat it out of the containers that whatever it's in. I'm talking about canned applesauce or packaged applesauce that they have heated inside of the container, the glass or the plastic. That breaks down... The, the stuff that's aseptically packaged, the canned. The heat and the lack of oxygen breaks down some of the pectin into formaldehyde. Lots of aldehydes slow down detox. Slowing down detox slows down bile output. Therefore, applesauce, canned applesauce, would slow down bile output because you'd your rate of detox very much goes with your rate of bile output. So that's how that would work. Toast is probably, they're just talking white toast, which is just no fiber at all. Very little. So it's a very low fiber diet. Got some fructose in there. Well, you got the applesauce and the bananas. So generally low fiber and fructose and starch without any fiber, you know, starch, the, the, the glue you know, rice and white bread in your stomach, it gets a little glue, like, like a little, little, uh, paper mache glue, like, so it would help slow things down. Also the lack of soluble fiber in general would reduce bile dumping. I mean, I, I tend to currently, so people always ask me, what's your diet? And I go, well, what month is it? Because my diet changes. 
it stays low vitamin A, but my diet changes all the time. I've been currently eating, you know, often I eat two bananas before my workout with some protein and I with a source of protein. And then I have two bananas after my workout with a source of protein. And I, I poop just fine, but not everybody is me and makes a lot of bile. Some people make a lot of bile and that's the source of their problems. Some people, they don't make a lot of bile or it all just goes back into their blood and that's the source of their problems. So yeah, if you notice, so here's the reality of it, Will. If you notice that you, when you eat more fructose, you poop less or less frequently and you take out the fruit and you poop better, all you need to know is that that affected you in that way. We have some people where they in increase their soluble fiber intake or they, they start doing oats or they start doing beans or they start doing more apples and they're like, my pooping is now amazing. And we go, well, if that's how it works for you, then do that. Because soluble fiber, when you understand toxic bile theory, soluble fiber could make certain people poop less and certain people poop better. You just have to understand the bile theory and then you have to understand watching your reaction to it. Your reaction to things is the only one that matters. But you also want to understand that doing certain toxic things can make you feel better in the short term. Nobody starts a coffee habit because they felt like the caffeine made them feel bad. It's only later that they get chronically tired from it and they can't go without it, which is a drug addiction by definition. So hope that answered it, Will. And thank you again for the super chat. Let me see. Did we get another one? Oh, there's another one. Okay. Oh. Nice one, Will. What do I think of the everything is parasites craze? I think it's a bunch of horse crap. There was a veterinary book I read a while back. It was a naturopathic doctor who was a vet. And he was saying, you know, there's a weird coincidence that I see in dogs. The sick dogs get parasites and the healthy dogs don't. And he said, the sick dogs, you get rid of the parasites in them. And then a little bit later, the parasites are back. And you're treating it again. Get them gone. Parasites come back. Healthy dogs don't get the parasites. What do flies like to feed on? Trash, crap, garbage. Where do they like to lay their eggs if you had a wound? Oh, they put, they put their eggs right in the necrotic, dead, diseased, damaged tissue. Parasites thrive on that type of tissue. I'm not saying that a healthy person could not get infected with a parasite, but, but you have an immune system. Remember, you're this giant, you know, compared to like the little the little things out there, you're this giant, right? Can we die from a bacterial infection? Yeah, so these little bacteria could kill us. Do you not think that your own immune system could kill a tiny little parasite? Why can't our immune system kill a parasite? It's just little, right? Little bacteria could kill us. Why can't our gut bacteria and our immune system, our white blood cells, kill parasites or can it if we are not feeding the parasites toxicity toxic tissue how would we make toxic tissue in our guts where parasites love to live oh i don't know toxic bile like basically like hot lava just damaging all the tissue that it touches creating dead diseased damaged tissue for parasites to feed on. Um, that's, I don't, okay. So if somebody comes to me and they're like, I think I have parasites. I tell them go to parasitetesting.com. You can order your own tests there. They do a, get the stool and saliva, the comprehensive test. Now what you do with that information later is the whole nother thing that I'm not going to go into. They just recommend you do their 
the the combo parasite treatment that they like. And I look at the ingredients in that and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like citraldehyde and all sorts of... The funny thing is, is they always treat parasites with things that are really toxic for your liver. If you look up black walnut and liver liver injury and you look up the meds for treating parasites, all the anti-parasite things damage your liver a lot. So what do we do? If I have somebody with parasites, if we, if, if they have, if they come up positive on it, a lot of people do the parasite testing and nothing shows up. What do you do then? Well, we do what I was going to do anyway, which is reduce the toxins coming in, help them re- re- get rid of the stored toxins, give them the minerals their body needs. And we, we get, results that they didn't get before. The funny thing is, is I have people come to me with Lyme and we, we start treating them and they're like, this is working better than all the tens of thousands of dollars I spent on IVs and antibiotics and seeing all these Lyme literate doctors. And, and I'm like, anything that is in you infection wise, the healthier we make your body, the more your body is going to constantly assault whatever is there. You want your own immune system to be constantly assaulting these things. You don't want to take herbs to boost your immune system. Why not? They're looking at your white blood cell response when they look at these things and they see, oh, oh, this person took echinacea or golden seal and their immune, their, their white blood cells went up. Your white blood cells are the garbage men of your body. If you take something and your white blood cells go up immediately, that likely means you just took in garbage and toxic stuff and your body made more garbage collectors to get rid of it. Plants make chemical warfare. If you look up uh, berberine, which is a big thing that people use for parasites, it's in golden seal, it's in uh, Oregon grape root. It's very yellow. We, we, you want to know a pattern if you didn't know it already? Things that are very, very yellow, are that's one of the ways they mark toxicity in nature the best. Red and yellow are two of the biggest toxic colors. Bitter taste is also how nature marks poisons. Berberine herbs, you ever had those? So bitter. Weird pattern we're seeing here. And they cause liver injury. but they kill parasites. What are we doing? Are we just stopping bile flow and people notice their symptoms get better for a while and then the bile flow comes back and the toxicity comes back and then the parasites are right back. Oh, and if you do try to get rid of parasites, you need to test again when you think they're gone to see if they're actually gone. Nobody does that. Everybody's too cheap. Everybody's too lazy. Nobody tests to see if the parasites are actually gone. They just go, well, I feel better. Must be all gone, and they don't test again. Do I tend to treat parasites directly? No. I don't need that to go away. Thanks for doing that pop-up, computer. Um, That's that. So, let's see. Let me make sure I didn't miss any other. We're going to wrap this up pretty soon. So, if you have a super chat you want to get in, Get in. Okay, so let me get to the second question on the list now. Monica, um, hi, Dr. Smith. What are your thoughts on eating carob bean, i.e. flour, for desserts? Thanks ever so much for your work. I'm pretty sure carob, the two things that I would think of, I mean, can you eat it? Let me, let, I want you to understand something here. You can eat whatever the heck you want. I don't care. If I worried about what people actually ate, I'd die of stress. So why I can't worry. I can't do my work worrying about what other people eat. And there's also the idea. So if I say something's okay, then people go, well, I can eat as much of this as I want. And that's not good either if there's issues with it. So I don't say you can never eat something. And I often won't say that something is totally okay because then people abuse that little piece of information. Okay. I mean, if if somebody said like, I mean, I'm just going to give an example here. If somebody's like Dr. Smith, once a year, 
I'm going to give an extreme example here. Or once a year or maybe twice a year, I smoke an all-natural organic cigarette. Can I do that? Can you? Yeah, you can. Do I think that that is like a huge, huge negative? Like if they were like, no, I'm doing really well on the diet. Otherwise, my, my symptoms are getting better. I just like whenever I hang out with my cousin, it's like a thing we've been doing since childhood. And I, I really enjoy it. And it's like twice a year. I'd be like, you're improving. That's probably not a big deal. So this is how I'm going to say it. That's probably not a big deal. So in a way I'm saying it's probably okay. But then if some moron on the internet takes that and they go, Dr. Smith said it's okay to smoke cigarettes. What the hell's going on? This work takes intelligence, folks. You have to be able to see the gray area. You have to live a life too. Life is toxic. You're going to die. If you get to bond more with your cousin doing something you guys have done since childhood, and it's not that, it's not like you're picking up a cigarette habit that you're smoking every day. You do it twice a year. Like that, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not going to let people on here. This is not a cult. This is is not a cult. I'm trying to teach people how to function within their daily lives. Now, some people have the like the purity spiral where they think that you have to be pure in everything all the time. I'm not pure in everything all the time. I've gotten rid of all my stuff, but I was I used to be a lot more strict. And as I've gotten better, I can find myself, I can be a little less strict. But I can't tell a newbie, oh yeah, do what I do now. Because then it might take them twice as long to get better. If somebody's really sick, they might not get better. Context is everything. And just so you guys know, any of you who are in like in my programs or you're here and you're wandering around the internet saying, Dr. Smith said, absolutely not. Dr. Smith, you know, be careful of that. This is not a cult. If people don't like it, they can leave at any time. I don't care if you, I, I love having all the people in the Love Your Liver Network. I love all of you. And if you decide to leave, okay. Okay. I'm not trying to keep you here. I'm providing the information in the community so that you can help yourself get better and you can get in, you know, advice from other people. I'm here to help doing what I do. We're helping lots of people with just this information here. But yeah, it's not, we're not trying to make it like a purity cult. So carob bean on that note. So like I just did a search. So this is what I tend to do when stuff is not a high vitamin A thing. Like chocolate's not a high vitamin A thing. And what do we use carob for? We use carob as a substitute for chocolate, right? Well, here's a little duck, duck, go search on carobs and polyphenols. I'm, I, I'm just going to read the parts that I can see here on this. Polyphenols and carobs, a review on their composition. Effects of polyphenol parentheses carob supplementation on uh, probably body weight. Um, utilization of carob fruit as sources of phenolic compounds. Polyphenols. Oh, that's the same one. Carob pod polyphenols suppress the differentiation of adipocytes. So there's just, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, there's polyphenols. Okay. So then we might go carob and copper. Let's just see if there's a lot of copper in it. I don't know. Doesn't look like, doesn't look like that's a big, a big issue. So anyway, so if somebody, let's say we we're trying to move this whole thing forward. If somebody was like, I'm addicted to chocolate, which I've dealt with people like that. If you're addicted to chocolate, if you actually feel like you cannot live without chocolate, you are so copper toxic. You're absolutely copper toxic. Remember. Toxic things, people want more of toxic things. Crackheads love crack, right? It doesn't mean it's good for them. 
People get addicted to toxic things. People get addicted to toxic girlfriends and boyfriends, right? People get addicted to toxic drugs. People get addicted to toxic foods. You don't get addicted to the things that you need to survive. Like nobody's addicted to beef. You can really like it and want to have it, but that's not addiction. Like if you want some protein, you just go eat, you know, some chicken. You can still get the protein. You're not addicted to beef, but people get addicted to cigarettes. People get addicted to chocolate. People get addicted to crack. People get addicted to toxic people like narcissists and all that stuff. So if you have a chocolate addiction, I'm telling you already, you're copper toxic. So let's say, could we weigh the pros and cons of, let's say, carob versus chocolate? Sure. Seems that carob's a lot lower in copper than chocolate. Carob's still got probably a healthy dose of polyphenols or they wouldn't be supplementing people with carob polyphenols. Um, we're not a fan of polyphenols here. They slow down ALDH2, the plant antioxidants. So... Could it be a, if you were moving towards, if you were, let's, or let's say you were trying to make some healthier things for your kids and they were still kind of hooked on chocolate, or you were trying to get over a chocolate addiction, you could probably, it, it would probably be a good move in that direction. So that's what we could say. Overall, you know, high polyphenol foods, we do want to try to move away from them, but you can't avoid them. They're in all plant foods. And so you'd just be making choices. So, so like if I were to say carob bean is totally okay, it might, you know, if somebody says, well, I'm going to make carob bean stuff every day then. Well, that might not be a great idea. So that's why I don't tend to say things are okay or totally off the list because it depends on how you're using it. Do you see this? This work is for intelligent people. This is not black and white work. You know how I talked about egg whites earlier? I typically have egg whites at a, at, a, at a breakfast that Julie and I have, my practice manager. I typically have egg whites once a week. Once a week. Am I going to worry about that? No, I don't have the yolks. I have egg whites. So the vitamin A is not an issue, but like I said, sulfur's in all foods. Sulfur's in beef. Can't avoid sulfur. But you can avoid the really big sources of it like the cruciferous vegetables and the allium vegetables. Okay. So that's, that's how I got that. Uh, Monica says, how would you minimize polyphenols from beans? I talked about this before. It's only in the outer part of the bean. If you open up a bean, the whole inside is white. So there's no polyphenols on the inside, really. It's only on the outside. Now, the other thing about soluble fiber, toxins in soluble fiber, for people who want to talk about copper in beans and polyphenols in beans, a lot of that is going to stay bound up in the soluble fiber. Holy cow, who just did that? Oh, I'll get to that super chat in just a second. Don't worry. Um, poly, I'm not, I'm not that worried about things. So there are people out there, there are people in the network who absolutely the copper in beans or in grains is absolutely too much for them. And they know this. I encourage people to watch that stuff. And this person in there knows, she's like, I, I, I wonder, sometimes I wonder what the extent of her diet is. I haven't asked her, but she just knows like certain plant foods, especially beans and grains are way too much copper for her. So I say, okay, don't eat them. But a lot of people, um, do just fine on it. And it's probably because most of the copper is bound up in the soluble fiber and stays there. That's, I mean, that's why we're using soluble fiber, right? To bind up the toxic bile and to poop it out. So it should make sense that it could bind up the very things that are in it, right? That's, that's basically the gist of that. I'm not that worried about it. Now, if people are eating, like I had one person where I had to tone her down. She was eating three cups or three cans of beans a day. I had to be like, no, you got to tone that down. She was coming to me saying, I don't feel so good. And I was like, I never said to eat that many beans. <laughs> I actually would have limited you to a can and a half. If you were going to, if you were going to max it out, a can and a half.
I do put limits in the program and people often kind of just skip over those. And then they come back and they're like, I'm doing this. And I go, yeah, that's, you're out of bounds. You're, you went way over the limit. I put it in the article right there. So read the articles carefully, folks. I, I tend to always put limits on things. Okay. Reliable Andrew asked, oh, sorry, let me, uh, this is a yes or no question. Hi, Dr. Smith, would you recommend supplemental EPA, DP, DHA, EPA and DHA? No, never. Nope. Don't use it with anybody. Okay, let me find this. Where is it? Brave 16. Wow. Just donating to the cause, Dr. Smith. Thanks for what you do. This is Gabe. See you on the inner circle. Wow, Gabe. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Gabe is a diehard. Gabe's great. Gabe and I have good conversations. Gabe's diehard and he's awesome. So thank you very much, Gabe. I appreciate that. And I will see you on the inner circle. We got to, I got to get there pretty soon. I think I'll get like one more, one or two more questions, depending upon how they are. So, well, let me just back up on the EPA and DHA thing. Everybody's talking about omega-3 and omega-6 balance and seed oils and da, 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 da. okay. The problems with fats originated when humans started making isolated fats and oils, we created the problem. It's like watching a Marvel movie, right? In the Marvel movies or all the superhero movies, the superheroes create their own problems. There wasn't a problem. The superheroes decided to do something stupid and now all of a sudden they have a problem. It's going to ruin the world. We caused it and now we have to fix it. It's so, so played out. My goodness. If you're still going to watch those movies, my goodness, just stop paying them money. So, making oils, the very act of starting to make oils and isolated fats is what caused our fat imbalance problem. If you find somebody who eats a clean, whole foods, mixed diet, they are not going to have an omega-3 and an omega-6 problem. Okay, properly fed animals and the right plant foods. Now, the other thing that people don't know is like fish oil is hugely full of vitamin A. It's full of vitamin A. So you're not only getting an EPA and DHA supplement, you're getting a vitamin A supplement at the same time. So I no, we, we don't use it at all. If somebody came to me and they were on it and they're like, oh my gosh, if I don't take this, my joints hurt so bad. Well, first of all, I'd say that fish oil is stopping your bile flow. And that's why you feel better when you take it. So your goal, so would I yank it away from them right at the start? No, I don't do that. I'd say, keep, if you need to keep using it, do all the other things on the program keep using the fish oil or EPA, DHA, whatever it is. And as you, as your joint pain gets less, then you're going to reduce your consumption of it. We don't tear the crutches away from the person who's limping around. We let them use the crutches while we help them heal the damage. But we have to understand that it's a crutch. It is suppressing some other reaction. Just like medications, pharmaceutical companies sell fish oil. Now that should tell you something. There's pharmaceutical fish oil. Now that should tell you pharmaceuticals companies make vitamin D three. They now sell fish oil. Oh, they want to take your knack back and make it prescription only. Everybody's like knack, knack, knack. I'm like, mm, no, it's a sulfur source. Acetylated sulfur. No, thanks. Remember, pharmaceutical companies originally developed NAC. So they developed it. It got into the supplement world. And now the, now the pharmaceutical companies are trying to take it back. Are you serious? You think that's going to save the world? No. Okay. I think this is the last question. Jim Beam asked, Dr. Smith, were you able to tolerate apples and bananas when you started eating them low vitamin A, or did it take some time before you felt good eating them? Um, I don't remember. I have, I have an interesting history with bananas. My mom loves to remind me of this. Um, when I was a kid, I used to eat like two or three bananas a day. When I when they were around, I was eating two or three bananas a day. 
And then I got sick of them. I don't know how long that took, but I got sick of them. I didn't eat bananas for like probably 10 years. I absolutely couldn't even stomach the thought of bananas. And then in more recent years, I think I may have had another cycle in there where I started eating tons of bananas again. And then I came off and I just couldn't even think about them. And then now it's like, we got to buy like three bunches of bananas at a time to, uh, to keep up. Cause I'm having like on my workout days, which I try to work out almost daily. Um, I'm eating four bananas a day. So it takes a lot of, you know, got to go to the store a couple times a week at that rate to get the bananas. Um, so I've always done well with bananas. Generally, I just, sometimes I overdo it. <laughs> I do well in them because I don't actually, this is the funny thing for you guys who want to figure out foods that you could do long-term. The foods you love are not good long-term foods generally, other than maybe beef because we're, what else are you going to eat? Right. But foods that you love like think of holiday foods where you're like, oh my gosh, I love having this at Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner or whatever, but you don't make it all the rest of the year. So you not actually having it makes it taste better when you do have it, right? So the things you love, if you start having them daily, you're going to get sick of them. To find the foods that you could probably eat on a regular basis, like food as fuel, it's things that you're just kind of like, yeah, they're all right. I don't love them, but they're all right. Like that's what bananas are to me and apples. Like I, I don't crave them, but I can eat them and they don't, they don't, I don't not like them. I don't love them, but I don't not like them. And that's, that seems to be something that is like a long-term food that's good for you, but it's not hitting like all the pleasure buttons. So then, you know, if you want to get into the whole dopamine thing and all that stuff, it's not, it's not doing that. Okay. So, okay. We got one more question now. Let me find it. Okay. Alexi Gladia. Thank you very much for the super chat. First, if I forgot to say thank you to anybody for the super chats, I mean, really, I appreciate it a lot. Um, what do you think about DHEA or pregnenolone supplements? I have docs recommending it and saying it won't interfere with your program, but I wanted to run it by you since I can't find anything on the network. Other doctors like speaking for my work. That's, that's cute. I guess that means, I guess I'm getting somewhere We're we're making inroads, right? This is a, it's a compliment. Okay. Anything you take is a load on your liver. Hormones are some of the most complex and complicated things for your liver to break down. Let me give you an example. Uh, let me see if I can find the paper. Yeah, that looks close enough. Okay. Let me find a good line to read. This is too complicated. The, the wording is just not going to help anybody. Is that the same paper? I didn't want that paper. Okay, here we go. Oh, so intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Intrahepatic means inside the liver. It's either the liver cells are leaking toxic bile into the blood or the actual little, the teeniest, tiniest bile ducts in the liver are leaking bile into the blood. Okay, intrahepatic, within the liver, intra. Intra, within, hepatic, liver. Cholestasis bile going where it's not supposed to go, which basically means into the blood. Okay. 
this is let me put this link in here for you guys if you choose to look at it i see the other super chat thank you i will get to that oh i can't uh let me see if i can find um is that the same one yes yes okay so let me just find copy link address the link i had was way too long so i had to find a shorter link okay Here's the paper, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy levels of sulfated progesterone metabolites inhibit Farnesoid X receptor resulting in a cholestatic phenotype. So what all that means, high sulfated progesterone causes intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. So the increased hormones of pregnancy overload the liver, damage the liver, and then result in bile leakage. Here's the weird, here's, I'm just going to throw this out there as a really weird thing to contemplate. Bile acids are hormones. Go type in bile acid hormone, go type in bile salt hormone. Bile acids are hormones? And we're talking about toxic bile here? And I'm talking about hormones being very challenging and complex and complicated to be broken down by the liver. And now we just have hormones can cause cholestasis. What is going on? This is where we start to question all of conventional medical research and the theories that they give us. But anyway, so let's go into this. The endocrine signals, hormone signals, that cause cholestasis, toxic bile leakage, are not known. But three alpha sulfated progesterone metabolites have been shown to be elevated in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, leading us to study the impact of sulfated progesterone metabolites on Farnesoid X receptor mediated bile acid homeostasis pathway. So, just so you know, FXR, Farnesoid X receptor, that's related to what triggers bile dump or bile production or not. Okay. So we, they're just connected. Okay. But they're finding that there's elevated progesterone, sulfated progesterones in the blood. Well, why isn't the liver getting rid of them fast enough? Why are they causing damage to the liver? Um, so there was another one. Well, we'll just we'll just leave it at that. So, so what I wanted to get at, I wanted to get at just some simple concepts about it. Um, D, you you don't have. So, I, I want you to understand, understand hormone therapy when they are giving you hormones, pregnenolone, right? Dehydroepiandrosterone, I think is DHEA. I could be saying a little bit of it wrong. I don't care. Um, they're hormones and they are going to add to the load to your liver. If a doctor is giving you hormones, by definition, they're saying, I don't know how to fix this problem. So we are going to give you a Band-Aid crutch solution, symptom-related solution to help you feel better. We're going to give you something that is going to increase the load on your liver. It's not treating a cause. No one has a deficiency of taking hormones by mouth. <laughs> if they don't have a solution to actually raise your DHEA and pregnenolone levels back to the levels that they think they should be at, if they are not addressing a toxicity or a deficiency in order to fix your deficiencies of a hormone, which is a symptom, hormone deficiencies are symptoms. Unless you've had like, unless you're a guy and you've had your balls removed, like you still make testosterone. We can fix it, right? Ladies, even, even after menopause, like if people, if, one of the funny things is women are like, well, I'm postmenopausal, so I don't, I don't make hormones anymore. And that's like, oh, Oh, really? Well, 
your adrenals still make sex hormones. And this is always one thing. Here's one thing I've always been really interested in. So this plays into the whole bile acid hormone kind of thing. Like why when they neuter dogs, like when they cut the dog's balls off, why doesn't that dog, like if we say low testosterone is so bad for everybody, right? If it really is, why don't those dogs just wither and die? Why aren't they depressed? Why don't they have all these same problems that grown human men have with their low testosterone? These dogs have no balls. Do you really think that did their adrenal glands kick on that much? This doesn't this sound weird to you? Like it should. Somebody also posted another study about eunuchs. Eunuchs are 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 humans who have been neutered. And they were finding that they were living, I think it was, I think the I need to, I need to get that research. I don't have that research. So whoever posted that, if you see this, I need that link. I need to find that research. They lived something like 10 plus years longer than people who weren't. What is going on? I mean, one thing we could say is if people, if, if they don't have all their parts, they are not ejaculating, which means they are not losing zinc via that route. Zinc deficiency is huge. They're also not having to constantly make new semen and new sperm, which is, I mean, think of how much energy goes into creating the possibility of new life. So if you're constantly doing that, it's a lot of energy. Waste that energy all the time. Why would you not die sooner? You're wasting life energy. Um, Here's, here's some, so let me, let me go into what to do about this, Alexi. Okay. If you take those, I would, I would definitely add those things one at a time. If it were me, I might add the, if you were doing, if you decided to do them, I did pregnant alone in practice. I didn't notice squat from it. If you take either of these, I would maybe add them one, one, one week and one the next week. Or maybe even add one, see how that week goes, and then stop it, and then do the other one for a week and see how that goes. Okay? If neither of them help after a week, don't take them because they're not helping. See what I mean? I must have stuck something into my hand. Um... If you don't feel better from them, why take them? Why load your liver with stuff that's not helping you? That This is the same of almost any supplement except, let's say, minerals that we test you for and you're low in. And it may take a long time to refill minerals because we're working on essential stuff that's like what you're built of. So most of the times, the things, the supplements and other things that you take that you feel immediately, that's a drug effect. That's usually a, a big drug effect especially for like energy stuff and all that. If you take some magnesium and you feel relaxed and you can sleep better, that's a, that's a different effect. That's helping you rest and recover. That's very different than like stimulating. Like copper is very stimulating and things that tend to stimulate tend to overstimulate and burn things out faster. Vitamin A increases cellular turnover speed. So you burn out stuff. That's what Accu, that's, that's Grant's theory on Accutane. You take the Accutane, it actually speeds up the cell turnover, especially the oil producing cells so fast that they break down and then they're not working. And then you don't make as much oil and then you have less acne while your liver just got its ass handed to it. Also, you burn out your oil cells, which is why would your body be making excess oil coming out of your skin? Because you're toxic oil. What does oil carry? Fat soluble toxins. Why would your body be making oil coming out of your skin? Because your liver can't handle it. Your kidneys can't handle it. And now you're going to push it out through the skin. Same thing with all the other skin diseases. You're pushing toxins out through your skin. It's damaging your skin on the way out. And then it sits there until you wash your face off again. So anyway, uh, 
Jasic, uh, did I miss one? Oh no, no. Jasic, you did the you did the super chat. I don't see a question. So if you have a question, make sure to ask it. Or if you don't have a question, just say you don't have a question. Um, so I know that I didn't I didn't miss anything. Um let's see, I'm just gonna check. I gotta wrap this up, folks. Thank you. So wow, the super chats were crazy today. I really appreciate that. And uh, if for those of you who are interested in potentially having unlimited questions, well, not I mean, not unlimited. I do have a time limit, but inside the Love Your Liver, or sorry, it's the Nutrition Detective Network. We changed the name. The Nutrition Detective Network is the whole thing. Inside the the if you if you get access to the Love Your Liver Network, which is a paid you know thing, then. There is also the inner circle, which is where after this, I'm probably going to go there for about an hour and a half and answer questions for an hour and a half for people who, you know, they pay a monthly fee and then I just answer questions and questions and questions. And I can be a bit more controversial than I am here um, because I'm not under the risk of being uh, muted or uh, censored or anything like that. So anyway, let me go down. I, th I saw a comment. Ali liked my comment. Your 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 liver just had its ass handed to it. Yes, and remember, your bile, your toxic bile, is the liver's poop. So in a way, it, it, you know, it's it's a good analogy, right? Um, but Jasic, I don't see a question, and I do want to get to it if if you have one. So if you have it, uh, just make sure to you could maybe email it to Julie. Um, if you, if you guys ever have questions, if you want to work with me, you want to ask, like I, I live in, I had somebody from the Canary Islands contact me the other day and they were wondering if we could work with them there. If you have questions about international stuff, international shipping, international, can we do, can we work together? I mean, all my work is zoom. I'm completely virtual. We've had clients in 28 countries. It's not a, as long as you can, as long as you can mail the hair test back and forth, that's the abs. Okay. So. I want the bloods if we can get the bloods. I use four blood tests. So those of you who have gone to like functional medicine practitioners and had pages and pages and pages of blood tests, I do four blood tests. That's all I need. I can I can look at extra, but in terms of what determines how I treat you, four blood tests. And even one of those is kind of not necessary in terms of it doesn't change my treatment approach, but I do it. It's the vitamin A test. You can have low vitamin A and have a toxic liver. You can have, if you have super high vitamin A, you definitely have a super toxic liver. If you have normal vitamin A, you're, you probably have a toxic liver too. Because nearly everybody who reduces the vitamin A in their diet gets better, but we don't get to see inside the liver. That's a problem. So we just have to, we have to assume. And yes, I do say that for a very specific reason. So Anyway, so you could email Julie at admin at nutritiondetective.com. I believe all that stuff is down in the in the um, info for the video. All of my social media connections are down there if you want to find me around the interwebs. And uh, yeah, I got to get going to go answer questions in the inner circle. Hope you all enjoyed it today. Uh, I, I had to do the question and answer today again because I was working so hard on that vitamin A and diabetes thread, which will drop hopefully within about two hours, I just have to go check all the links on it, make sure all the links are right. So people aren't like, well, I can't see the reference. And I'm like, I had somebody the other day on Twitter say, why don't you ever put references on your threads? And I'm like, did you even read it? Cause like practically every tweet or every other tweet has a reference on it. And I'm quoting studies like serious. Are you serious? That's why I'm putting references in the live chat for you to find. If you want to go look them up, I mean, I, I tell you the study name, I put the link in the live chat, and then I read the quote. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. I'm just putting, I'm just the one putting it together for you in a way that you can live a life without having to be like a shut in. Um, yeah. So anyway, y'all have a great day. I will uh, see you. Let me just check down at the bottom one more time. I don't see anything from Jasic. So anyway, Jasic, if you if you get this and you had a question, just email it to Julie at that address I just mentioned, and I'd be happy to get to it first thing next week. Um, I don't. I just want to make sure. I feel like I feel so like I'm going to be so guilty if I don't get to this question. Anyway, so that's all I have for today. 
Um, if you want to find me, nutritiondetective.com. The, the Madness of Modern Nutrition, our new free course, can be found if you type in um, madnessofmodernnutrition.com, that website, um, or you can go to members.nutritiondetective.com and then just ask to join and it'll put you into the, the free course. So you can also sign up for our email newsletter at the website. Hope you all enjoyed it. I'm off to the inner circle. Have a great weekend. Bye now.